Public health is a population-based field of science focused on preventing disease and promoting health. Every week, we will be engaging in interactive discussions and analyses of the latest public health issues affecting you and your communities all around the world. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. Hey everyone, my name is Ben and I'm here with our public health panel, Gordon, LaShawn, Sully, and Will. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is simulated human intelligence in machines and it has been widely considered as one of humanity's crowning technological achievements. However, in COVID-19's effect on the world has led to challenges that we have never faced before. In response, global collaboration has resulted in the sharing of data to the point that it cannot be feasibly analyzed by humans alone. In this episode, we will be discussing an article written by Wim Naud called Artificial Intelligence Against COVID-19, an Early Review, published in the Journal of AI and Society. In this article, he discusses the current contributions of AI against COVID-19, as well as current challenges that exist. Specifically, he outlines six ways that AI has been helping, such as early warnings and alerts, tracking and prediction, data dashboards, diagnosis and prognosis, treatment and cures, and social controls. Throughout our discussion, we will be highlighting the pros and cons of each aspect with their implications on the future. In this arena of action, is AI to be our champion? For me, quite simply, AI means a system of algorithms based on historical data on certain you know, health or non-health related events that can help human beings make predictions on how future events will impact our health. When I think of it, it's a tool that can accelerate what we already do so that we can be more focused on more important matters. So I'm going to focus on the intelligence part of this artificial intelligence. And when I think about that, first thing that comes to mind is the ability to adapt and change as more stimulus comes its way, much like a human can. As we grow and age and learn things, we accumulate more skills and our understanding of the world or different subjects broadens. So looking at examples of AI in non-healthcare scenarios, we have agriculture where there's AI-based tools that can analyze the nutrient profiles of soil to give greater efficiency when growing crops. We have AI in space exploration. It's being attached with robots to analyze planets and see if they're hospitable in the future. An insane amount of things that we can do with AI, and it's super adaptable and super flexible. But I wanted to move the conversation to the healthcare scenario In the sense of COVID-19, what does AI look like in the landscape of combating COVID-19? Another element where AI has been helping uh, governments control the spread of COVID-19 is right now uh, a drug called remdesivir has got the emergency approval for use by the FDA in the United States. And part of drug development and drug repurposing, what AI does is AI looks at a pathogen such as a virus and it runs computational models to determine, in the case of drug repurposing, what drugs have the highest chance of success in potentially improving treatment outcomes. So I'm not sure if remdesivir in particular was, uh, was identified in that way, but I know other biologics that are used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and um, cancer have been identified in that way, and they're potentially being explored for use to treat COVID-19 patients. The article also talked about how AI is used for tracking and prediction purposes. In the case of COVID-19, we've seen that AI develop models to show how the virus is evolving and spreading. And this is very important for us as public health professionals because having the ability to take existing data from what's going on in China and predicting what the potential impacts might be for Canada allows our public health officials and various other government sectors to quickly mobilize and ensure that we have the necessary resources and other systems in place just to be able to anticipate and prepare for things like pandemics and even um, your things like annual flu seasons or other events that are typically are difficult to predict but with the right data will potentially help us in the future. So we know that AI is this black box where information is being fed in and we have an outcome. And we know that the outcome is only as good as the information being fed in. 
So my concern is that if we have information coming from China, which has its own specific contextual nuances in terms of population, healthcare infrastructure, um, demographics of the aging population, etc., how can we use that data, put into an AI system, come up with a result, and then use that result within a Canadian context? Just going off what you said, Ben, is that I'm sure we've all heard about you know, on the news how a lot of countries are kind of angry with China and the way they sort of responded to this whole pandemic. And if we kind of follow down that path and look at the data that they provide, since they were where this virus, since this virus started in China, if the Chinese government decided to withhold all data and all information on this virus, then that pretty much cuts the rest of the world off from having population information. People can easily politicize and use data for forwarding their own agenda which might have negative consequences. Yeah, and that's important because um, as we read in the article, open data sets are very important to build accurate and useful models. And I would like to quote Dr. Sanjay Gupta uh, on CNN. He always says when he's asked about you know, predictions and models is that all models are wrong and some are useful. So that notion is based on the fact that, as Ben alluded to earlier, that Models are as good as information that is inputted, but if that information changes on a real-time basis, then the models will always evolve and change as well. And this is because there's no historical precedence for COVID-19. So models from the influenza virus are being adapted to incorporate COVID-19 data to make predictions about how this virus will spread and what measures need to be taken to control it. Absolutely, Gordon. I think you're right. We also have to look at Yes, there's new data that the program has never seen before, but what happens if there's too much data? So, for example, social media has a lot of misinformation and fake news within it, and it's hard to ascertain how much of this news is legit. So when that's being fed into the AI program, it muddies up the interpretation to have a result that we can't really use. So an example of what's being done is that YouTube and Facebook are having actual AI content modulators that flag fake news. So we have this extra distillation effort trying to refine this data before it even gets into the COVID models. Right. And that's important for early warnings and alerts because humans build a model and then humans have to then interpret the model in a meaningful way. So there is, it's still error prone because AI isn't tasked with making the final decisions. And as we could see from the case of there's a, a Canadian-based AI model called Blue Dot that back in December, I think December 31st of 2019, there was various alerts sent out to um, their partners, which included some important governmental agencies around the world, uh, warning of a potential novel virus. And as we can see from WHO, they did not issue an alert, I believe, till more than a week later. So because the interpretation of these models is very complex and human judgment is ultimately the deciding factor and every expert tends to interpret these differently and that's why we have different models and different decisions being made from those models. Yeah, absolutely, cuz uh, another AI model called Health Map in the USA was able to sound the alarm earlier but a day before Blue Dot. However, the model's interpretation of the data was that there is not a significance to this outbreak. So it just shows that we do still require human interpretation and decision making when recognizing a threat. One of the things that came to mind for me was around privacy. And I just want to hear what you guys want have to say about being able to still find a way to utilize this tool, but at the same time, making sure that privacy laws are followed and that individuals aren't manipulated into having their, their personal information or data taken from them. Yeah, and it's contextual to certain countries. For example, in China, they have these infrared cameras that can recognize and scan 200 people per minute, and they focus on looking at body temperature and to see whether you're wearing a mask because it has temperature and facial recognition capacity. Now, that sounds great if you're trying to control a pandemic. However, there are challenges with this. For example, the way that it measures temperature is that, that it looks at the tear ducts of your eyes because apparently that's just the way that's been programmed. So if you have individuals wearing eye gear or glasses, it messes up that data. Secondly, when it's looking at temperature and trying to ascertain whether you have a fever, it doesn't take into account if you're wearing multiple layers of clothing. 
It doesn't take into account if you're just being physically active. Like, did you just run for your train? So what ends up happening is that let's say you walk through the train station, you almost missed your train, you ran to it, you get back home, you get tagged, and they say you have COVID-19 or you're suspected of it. There's a lot of privacy issues in that scenario, and there's also a lot of inaccuracies because it could pick up false positives. So it seems to me that AI in the state it is right now is going to always require human interpretation at one point or another. So well, that leads me to the question, will AI ever reach a point where it doesn't need that and it can do everything on its own? I think that's a very sci-fi discussion uh, along the lines of Blade Runner, The Matrix, or iRobot. But I think what's going to happen in the realm of AI and COVID is that COVID will act as a catalyst for AI to develop further, specifically in surveillance. And this raises a lot of privacy concerns. Now, it's privacy concerns in the sense of our privacy is being infringed upon for the greater good of controlling this pandemic. However, what I'm concerned about is that is this privacy going to be respected after COVID-19 is gone? For example, COVID-19 is gone, but the surveillance is continuing. When we ask the government, hey, why is this continuing? Their narrative may be, well, we want to be prepared for the next pandemic, where in reality, they may be using this data for other government measures. I have a question based on what Kaseli said. And my question is, do we even ever want AI to be fully uh, autonomous? Because that in itself is a potential problem. The fact that we, we built this super powerful tool that is just acting on its own. What comes to mind is automation. Like from, from my personal experience, I worked in a car manufacturing plant. And even though that whole process of manufacturing a car has been streamlined to the point where most of the major components of the car is made by a machine or a robot, and it's just the final touch-ups is made by humans, I don't, think, I don't think that AI should ever come to the point where it's fully acting on its own. Because in the, in the car example, as perfect as a robot is, there will be times when it breaks, and that's when the human comes in. And I think that's just the, that extra layer of safety just to ensure that at the end of the day, this is just a tool for us humans and something that we should make our own rather than letting it become that autonomous sci-fi thing that Ben had mentioned earlier. One thing we're missing is, you know, we, we talked about AI being potentially the final decision maker and some of the problems that causes. But what about AI in terms of active and passive surveillance, right? If we're talking about data privacy and the most vulnerable populations don't have agency over their own data, then surveillance in of itself becomes inequitable because AI can then potentially, if, if there's not that human interaction at the end of the interface, these artificial intelligence systems can make decisions that further create a health disparity between the most vulnerable population and the most wealthy population. The narrative of AI is that it's often this impartial, indifferent machine decision-making tool. But in reality, based off the data that we put into the algorithm, it's often a reflection of our own biases. For an example, they did a study where AI was used to look in automatic diagnostic imaging. So for example, x-rays and CTs, and it was used to make decisions on diagnosis. So they found that the AI was almost as good or if not better than radiologists in terms of looking at an X-ray or CT and coming up with a diagnosis based on the different studies or whatever. However, we have to consider that the biases of what we give the AI also come into play. So for example, we could have selection bias. If we only give this AI images of positive CTs and X-rays for tuberculosis, for example, then it's only going to know to look for that. And if we don't give it other images of non-tuberculosis images, then it doesn't have a comparative to make a decision. So what I'm saying is that the biases that we have can be also implicitly shown within AI, and we have to take that into account when making decisions. And another reason that is problematic is we've talked extensively about health equity and universal healthcare systems. So if you have um, the most vulnerable populations who cannot afford to go to the hospital if the country does not have a universal healthcare system, then you're only going to be capturing data from people who have the resources to go and seek medical care. So if the data is only representative of the most you know, healthy and wealthy population, then any kind of action in terms of treatments and outcomes uh, will not speak for people who aren't going there who happen to be the most worst off. 
Right. And then you create greater inequity because what if someone just faithfully agrees with the AI without understanding how it reached that decision? Another example is within the legal realm where there's an AI that can predict the possibility of a person committing a crime just based off facial recognition. So you'll show a picture of two people, but unfortunately due to the racial biases that exist within the data that the AI is provided, it's more likely to pick the person of color to commit a crime. Now, when you take that into account with the legal system that already has years of existing discrimination against people of color, the whole situation is being exacerbated. And that's a fantastic example because if you surveil the most vulnerable populations more than, you know, the average population, then you're going to find more incidents of crime. If you're preferentially feeding your model with racialized groups, then your model necessarily will predict that those racialized groups will commit more crime. So I've heard that AI being used as a tool to potentially help create a vaccine. Have you guys heard about this? And if so, can you guys maybe talk about this? I think that's a very interesting field of potential application. Yeah, so the, in terms of the AI and computational models, you know, if you group vaccines and um, treatments together, so medicines, um, what these models are able to do is to look at viral proteins, so the antigens, and determine what parts of these viruses um, will our immune system most effectively attack. So then when you get this information, what you would do is when you're creating vaccines, you would create vaccines against those specific proteins that your body seems to recognize more. So this is how AI is being used to increase the effectiveness of treatments and vaccine. So does this speed up the vaccine development period compared to just doing it regularly in um, a lab? It does, it does. But I think the difference here with COVID-19 is you do have those AI and computational models, but you also have more financial and human resources going into, everything is going towards a COVID-19 vaccine now. So any success in speeding up the production of vaccine from maybe two, three years with the mumps vaccine uh, to like, you know, maybe COVID vaccine takes a year. It's not only because of these models, it's also because Pretty much every lab in the world is working together to, to find a, a vaccine. Right. But let's say if everything was the same, all the resources, all the equipment was the same, and we had paired up an a AI versus a regular lab, would, would AI come out on top in that situation? So part of why, from what I understand, part of the reason why AI is also important is it prevents waste of resources. So if you have a lab looking at, and this is where, to answer your question, yes. This is if you have a lab looking at a protein um, that has a very little chance of eliciting an immune response, these models would probably give you a number saying this has a 5% chance of working. So when you're interpreting that data, you would then focus more on things that have a higher chance of creating an immunological response. So in that way, you lose less time going down the wrong rabbit hole and you can pursue things that have a greater chance of success. Mm -hmm. Google has a branch called DeepMind, which has kind of predicted the structure of proteins of the virus. So they also have a disclaimer on their website that talks about how these are structural predictions and they have not been experimentally verified. So going back to Will's question, when using AI, you have to work hand in hand with experimentally verified data because it can lead to maybe researchers focusing on specific areas that they might have not already thought about. Um, but I think at this point, um, in terms of their technology and their state of the field, I think they have to go hand in hand. So we had a discussion about the pros and cons of AI, but what do you guys think the future of AI is going to look like with COVID-19 as a catalyst? So I think it's important that humans and AI work together to improve the predictability for certain health and non-health outcomes. And the reason, as we've discussed today, is um, models can be wrong. And oftentimes, if you have a human at the end of the interface, they can prevent artificial intelligence systems from making bad decisions and vice versa. What I think the biggest future use of AI could potentially be in tracking that we've seen with COVID-19. And I see that this could potentially be further strengthened to track other, other sorts of things. For example, what came to my mind was um, natural disasters. If you're able to somehow predict the likelihood of a hurricane or a tsunami or earthquake or anything that can cause an emergency, um, it allows 
countries and regions to better prepare and hopefully save more lives. As we see in the future that more governments, countries, um, organizations take up AI, I think we also have to think about the possible trust implication. So, for example, if the government relies heavily on using AI technologies to make decisions on should they shut down borders, should they um, quarantine, should they do this, should they do that, I think in the event that AI fails to predict an outcome properly, I think there may be issues with trust in the communities that rely on the government. So there's a possibility for there to be a mistrust because, for example, the government claims that something's going to happen and it doesn't. Why would people listen to the government if they say to do certain things? So I think we just have to keep that in mind and there should be maybe some rules and regulations around that as well. In conclusion, AI may provide us with options but it is ultimately still human responsibility to make informed decisions based on the data available. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Remember, public health is a field of inquiry and an arena for action to improve lives one population at a time. This has been the Public Health Insight Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please drop us a like and follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your podcast platform of choice. You can also send us your questions, comments, and suggestions for discussion topics at thepublichealthinsight.gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.